Amen. Hey, make some noise if you're excited to be in God's house this Easter. Man, we're so grateful that you're here. Wherever you're at, if you're online with us today, you're out in the courtyard or you're in the house, we are so glad you're celebrating with us this Resurrection Day. In fact, I think uh, I was just looking up this statistic. It was kind of alarming to me. 66%, that's two-thirds of Americans, actually believe in the biblical account of the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, which was shocking to me because obviously 66% of America ain't going to church anywhere. So it's like a lot of them are not pursuing their faith, although they believe in this, what we're celebrating today. And even the third of people in America that don't believe in like the resurrection, many of them do believe that there's got to be more to life, that there's probably a designer and a, a creator of some kind. And so wherever you're at on your like faith journey here, can I'd love to personally invite you to continue your spiritual faith journey here at Discovery Church. And I say continue your spiritual journey because no matter, like even if you don't think you're on a spiritual journey, you are on a spiritual journey because you are creating the image of God. So even if you're an atheist today, you can't escape the fact that you got God's image inside of you and God has a plan for your life. Like he has a journey for your life. And I just believe that there's a lot of people who would be interested in taking that journey they just don't know what it is. They just don't know what that spiritual journey looks like, which is why people get caught up in weird things and in different directions. And so I'd love to invite you on a spiritual journey here at Discovery Church. It's actually why we named the church Discovery, because there's four different uh, components to like the journey that God has for your life. Here's how we like to say it at Discovery. We exist to lead people to love God, like in a real relationship with God, not with rules and regulations, but a relationship marked by love. Because if you do that, if you do have a relationship with God, you can actually do the second thing. We do. You can have the power to break free in Jesus' name. And, and you go, well, freedom, free from what? What do I find freedom from? Well, from that one area that you wish that wasn't a part of your life. Because most of us have an area. Every single one of us have areas in our life that we think like, man, my life would be so much better if this wasn't a part of it. Like I'd be so much happier or healthier or whatever if this thing, in fact, I know this isn't part of the journey. You need to know that you can be free in Jesus' name. And when we do that, we can do this third step, which is to love each other authentically. Like this is one of the beautiful reasons why God created us. He created us to have a relationship with others, to love people. And, and the sad reality is, though, is that many of us, like all, most of our relationships are hurting or they're broken and a lot of us have given up on them entirely because we just don't trust people anymore. So what we like to do is just bring healing back to your life so that you can learn how to love people and be loved by them so that ultimately you can do this last thing, which is change the world for the cause of Christ. You were created to make a difference with your life and your life will never make sense until you tap into this, that you were born for transcendence. You were born to touch lives in such a way that it impacts them for eternity. And this is actually where real joy comes from. You ask anybody here at Discovery that has discovered their gifts and they're like actively using them to make a difference in other people's lives. Those are the happiest people at church today. Those are the happiest people in their homes. They're most likely the happiest people at church or in their workplaces. And, and, who, and I'm just your tour guide, you guys. I'm not your preacher. I'm just the guy who wants to take you on a journey, a spiritual journey that I believe can change your life forever. Now, to help you out with this and help us take you on a spiritual journey, we have this connection card. Do me a favor. Will you grab this out real quick? It's in the front of the seat. Even if you're part of the family here at Discovery or you're not, do me a favor. Pull out this card. Put it in your hands. There's a few things that I would love every once a year I do this. Part of this is the like a normal connection card. We do this every week, this connection card part, which there's a prayer request on there. If you have any needs that you'd like us to pray for, whether they're confidential or not, you can check off that box. We would love to pray for you. The backside, though, is an annual Easter survey, and I do this like once a year. I like to get some information from you guys to help me take you on the spiritual journey we have for you this year. Now, um, for those of you that are asking, like, why do it once a year here, though? Why on Easter? Because this is the day you guys all come to church together, okay? The one day. <laughs> So I'm gonna, if I get information from you, this is the time I'm, I'm going to do it. So uh, every year it's different questions that I'm kind of pulling you. Get, and, and here's the question I have for you this year. I'll, I'll show you the first one at least. The first one, um, first question is that I'll be teaching a series 
called Truth Over Trend. I'll be looking at some hot topics and some, some of those debatable issues. I want to offend some people in September and, and tell you what the Bible says about some of these things. Here's what the world says. Here's what God says. And so I, I put a list of things like, wh- what, are, what are some trends that you'd like to hear what the Bible says about? Okay, now if, if I didn't list it there for you, that's okay. There's a, there's a spot there right in what you would like to hear, a teaching about what the Bible says about some sort of controversial topic or trend, and, and I promise I will only offend half of you. No, I'm just kidding. But and for those of you who are thinking, look, come on, Pastor Jason, you're the one who's supposed to develop the messages here. I'm doing your job. Jesus actually did this. You know, mo- much of the content that Jesus would preach at, about was actually coming from the questions of the crowd. They would pose a question to him and he would teach based upon their needs. So we're gonna do something similar and I'm gonna pray as I always do and and ask God what he wants us to bring. Hold on to that card though, put it away. We'll come back to it in just a moment. Much of Jesus' life and ministry, um, it surprised people. Like what he said, what he did, who he hung out with. Like, like, he wasn't the Messiah people expected him to be, which is why they, they crucified him and killed him. He didn't do what they expected him to do. Uh, he didn't even stay dead like they expected him to stay dead. So today, I, what I want to do is I want to show you some unexpected things that Jesus continued to do after he rose from the grave. We're going to be in John's gospel. You have sermon notes. Go ahead and grab those. I got scriptures on the screen as well. But I want to show you and study John's account of the resurrection and what happens after the resurrection from his perspective, which is why if you were here in the beginning of the service, that opening video was John's perspective. Let's go there together in John chapter 20, verse 1. It says, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Let me time out right here and just kind of point out to you again, this is John's gospel and John's writing from his perspective. But there's a lot of humor in the Bible and a lot of people miss it, man. I want to help you catch some of the humor because I like, I read the Bible different than some of you. Y'all okay if we have some fun in church today, okay? So, so John often calls himself in his gospel, he calls himself the other disciple. Look what he says. He says, she, Mary, came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. Like that's what he's going, like John, he already said he loves everybody. Get over yourself, dude. I'm the one Jesus loved. And she said, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they put him. So at this point, they think the body's been stolen. They don't know he's been resurrected yet. So Peter and the other disciple, that's him, started for the tomb. Both were running but look what he says. The other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He was faster. He was faster. He just wanted you to know, I won. I won Peter, okay? Which it doesn't like, like it's not necessary to the story at all, yet the Holy Spirit allows him to put it in there for some reason. He bent over, John did, and looked in, in at the strips of linen lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter, who was really late and he was slow, he came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was lying in its place, separate from the linen. We'll come back to that later. Finally, the other disciple, who, by the way, reached the tomb first, he adds it again. Like, what are you doing, John? Get over yourself. He also went inside. He saw and believed. I know we celebrated already. Can we celebrate one more time? He is risen. Come on, church. Now, That's the resurrection account that we get in John's gospel. In fact, in in all four of the gospels, there's not a lot of real estate in scripture that the the gospels give to the actual resurrection, that the, the rest of John's gospel is now about the fact that Jesus would continue to appear to people. He would appear, he would show up on five different occurrences on Resurrection Sunday and at least 10 other times before he would ascend back up to heaven. So in preparation for Easter, what I like to do, you guys, is I read the gospel stories over and over, the resurrection, like 20 times, and I pray through it on what God would have me share to his people. And and the thing that stood out to me this year, I've never preached on this, but what stood out to me was who he appeared to, and like, why them? Why did he appear to them? And where he showed up because he had all the earth at his disposal. He's Jesus. He could go anywhere at any time. So let me ask you a question. I asked myself some of these questions as I was studying this. So let me ask you the question. Like if you were Jesus, where would you go first? 
Like you can go anywhere, anywhere. Where would you, where would you go first? Would you, would you go to the temple and would you go sit on the throne of David? Take your rightful place, Messiah and King, I'm here. Or would you go directly like Caesar's palace? And you're like, that's it. We taken over the world, man. I'm back. I'm here. I'm risen. No, he doesn't do that. Why? Jesus didn't come to start a religion. He came to restore a relationship. And this is the central message of the gospel. He was not the Messiah they expected him to be. He, he was not. So, so he didn't go to the temple or to Caesar's palace. Instead, he appears by his tomb with his linens all folded up and stuff. And he invites people in to his most painful experience of his whole life. And probably never before has there been a greater contrast than the one who defeated death standing next to his tomb. And then he appears in a room with his disciples, his friends, and to offer the proof of his resurrection. He doesn't do a miracle. He doesn't turn water into wine. He doesn't say, reach out your hand, make it leprous and heal it again. No, he shows his scars and he opens the tomb and he invites people in to see his suffering. How unexpected a king is Jesus, a messiah is Jesus. Where would you go first? And there's another question I ask, who would you appear to first? Like if you were Jesus, who would you? You can go anywhere, you can do anything. Like to me, when I, when I was asking myself this question, my mind first went to mom, Mary, because in the gospel stories, she's last seen at the foot of the cross. And she's seen the death penalty executed on her son, Jesus, that he was so beaten beyond recognition and the, the brokenness that Jesus would have to even experience her in, in that pain. So I kind of, if I was Jesus, I want to go to mom and just be like, mom, I'm okay, I'm okay. All right, and then immediately after that, my mind thought of Pilate. I'd like to go see Pilate. You know what I mean? That dude who sentenced me to death. This is just me. I know if, I'm not Jesus, okay? But, but in, in Matthew's story of, of you know, the, the sentencing of Jesus to death, Pilate's wife didn't agree with him. Y'all know that? Pilate's wife was like, hey, don't do it. See, I'm all need to listen to your wife, you know? She's like, hey, this doesn't feel right. Don't do it. And then, and then again, like as he's going to issue the sentence, she slips him a note right before him. was like, I had a bad dream. This is not good. Please don't go through with this. And he does it anyway. So I kind of would like to show up to Pilate and be like, you should have listened to your wife, dude. Just kind of settle that argument right there. What's interesting, though, is the unlikely people that Jesus does appear to. And I hope in some way it can be something you can relate to because the rest of John's gospel is about these resurrection appearances. And I want to show you the three that John shows us. And I think there's a reason. I think it reveals something about Jesus. And I think Jesus wanted you to know something. That's why he showed up intentionally. Here's Because the first one, listen, the first one Jesus showed up to, wasn't one of the disciples. It wasn't a holy, it wasn't a religious person, it wasn't the church. It was a woman by the name of Mary Magdalene. Now Mary Magdalene was, we're told in the gospels, that she was actually delivered by Jesus of seven demon spirits. And a lot of theologians believe that she, she, she probably suffered a lot of abuse to actually attract the, the torment and for her to be tormented by demonic spirits so much. This is who Jesus decides the first appearance. Let's look at it in John's gospel. Pick it up in verse 11 with me. Now Mary, that's, that's Mary Magdalene, stood outside the tomb. The guy's already left. Peter and John are already gone, but she's, she's stuck there. She's so brokenhearted she can't move. She's having a hard time coping with the situation. And I want to pause right here for just a moment and speak to anyone who's hurting, to anyone who feels like you can't move on from the pain that you experience, who's having a hard time coping, who feels a little bit brokenhearted, that maybe it was a marriage or a child or some kind of hurt that you've been through. Here is Mary, and she's crying. The Bible says, as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and one other at the foot. Time out real quick. When angels show up in the Bible, oftentimes, like it's met with holy fear. People fall, they tremble. There's such glory with their prayer presence. They respond in ways of, of fear, but she doesn't respond that way. Look how the angels though, the angels asked her, notice all of heaven is drawn to her soul that is hurting. They say, woman, why are you crying? And I want you to catch this because it doesn't feel like heaven is attracted to your pain, but I want you to know, um, the reason why you can't sense heaven in the moment of your hurt is because your hurt is blocking it. And here she doesn't even realize she's having a moment. Heaven is meeting her right here. And look how she responds. 
they've taken away my Lord. And I don't know where, where they put him. And at this, she turns around and you get the very first appearance of Jesus. And he didn't appear to, to someone who was ready to worship him and praise him. He appears to someone hurting. She was standing there. Jesus was standing there, but she didn't even recognize that it was Jesus. And I love telling people who are hurting and who are, who are broken, who are going through something difficult. There is something about your brokenness that heaven is attracted to. And there is a promise in the Bible in Psalm chapter 34, verse 18, that the Lord is close to your hurt, to your pain, to your brokenness. He's attracted to it. He could have gone anywhere. He had all earth at his disposal, and he chose to first show up to somebody who was hurting so he can save those who are crushed in spirit. So the very first appearance to Mary, it shows us something about Jesus. And I think Jesus wants you to know this today. Will you write it down? Jesus isn't as far away as some of you think, so just look for him. You don't think he's close, but I promise you, he is. And can I even encourage you to do that even in this service, that we've designed this service in such a way with such prayer and intentionality that, that you would see and sense the living God the risen king. If you would just look for him, the Bible says that if you look for him with all your heart, you'll find him because he's here. Hey, hey, Jesus is here. So, so the first resurrection was to someone who was hurting. The second encounter, Jesus appears to someone you probably know, you probably know the name, even though, you may, you, even if you've never been to church <laughs> in your whole life, you probably know the name Doubting Thomas, Right? Poor Thomas, man, he doubts one time. And then forever he stuck with the name Doubting Thomas. I've often wondered if that's what happened to Karen. Do you know what I mean? Poor Karen, she was just having a bad day. You know what I mean? Is that what happened to Karen? She was having a bad day, went off on one waiter when a millennial was filming her in her bob haircut. And now it's like, don't be a Karen. I'm sorry if you're Karen, by the way. We so, so here's what happens. Jesus appears to the disciples, but Thomas isn't there. And, 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 and the reason why was because Thomas already checked out. Thomas was like, it's it. It's over. Mission over. It isn't, it isn't going to happen. So he's, he's at this point officially become a doubter. And John continues and it says, now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the 12 was not when, with the disciples when Jesus came. And you would think, man, that's tough for Thomas. He missed out. So the other disciples actually rubbed it in. They told him, we have seen the Lord. And I almost feel like that's how doub doubters feel. It's, it's almost like they miss out on something. I don't understand why you guys are jumping up and down and raising your hand and, and like, why would you so happy? I don't get you people. And there's something in their mind that thinks there's either, either something wrong with you or there's something wrong with you, me, but there's totally, there is something wrong here. I just don't know what it is. And he actually draws a line in the sand. He goes, unless... I see the nail marks in his hand for myself. Unless I put my hand on the side, I'll never become a believer. I just, I just won't believe. And I want you to hear this for every person who says, what's up with you people? I just can't go there. I don't, I don't, I don't know what's happening here. I can't, I can't go there. Listen to me. Jesus isn't turned off by your doubts. And your doubts aren't going to keep Jesus away from you. Because, listen to me, Jesus loved Thomas so much that he shows up a second time just for him. Let me show it to you. Verse 26. A week later, his disciples were in the house again. And this time, Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them, which means he popped through the walls in the room and just showed up, which makes this line, next line, very necessary. He said, peace be with you. Okay? Because that obviously freaked them out. I mean, just a few days earlier, one of his disciples chopped off an ear of a servant. So Jesus knows they're packing. He ain't going to come up in here and be like, get an ear chopped off or a finger or something like that. They're saved, but they ain't soft. You know what I'm saying? Come on, somebody. Peace. Hey, y'all, put it away. I'm, I'm, I told you I read the Bible different than some of you, okay? <laughs> then he said to Thomas, really? Three years I've been walking with you, Thomas. Really? And you still don't believe? I mean, you saw me, dad. I'm standing here right here. Really? Dude, I just popped through a wall. Really? He doesn't say that. And I think that's sometimes how some of us treat doubters. Really? Really? You, you're going to doubt God now after all he's done? But Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus comes to where he is. And he says, okay, here you go. Put your finger 
right here, see my hands. And then he asked the doubter to do something. He says, but I need you to take a step. I need you to actually, I'll come to you. I'll, I'll, I'll pop through walls. I'll show up. I'll take, but, but I need you to do one thing. Just reach out. Just reach out right where you are in the middle of your doubts, Thomas, and take a step. Reach out your hand. Put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas, that's all he needed. He said, my Lord and my God. So the first person Jesus appears to, and this is intentional, unexpected, but intentional. First person Jesus appears to, all of earth at his disposal, he goes to someone hurting, someone who's brokenhearted. The second person he goes to is a doubter. Here's what this reveals about Jesus and what I think he wants you to know today. Jesus isn't bothered by your doubts. So will you just reach out to him today? That's all he needs. He'll show up in the middle of your doubts like he's doing right now and just ask you, reach out to me. Jesus rose from the grave and he appeared to someone hurting and he appeared to someone doubting. And then he goes and he finds the last one. And, and this time, now he finds a failure, like a bad failure, a miserable failure. He goes and finds Peter, one of his apostles. And Peter's having a bad weekend, man, a really bad weekend. Because Thursday night in the Last Supper, he told Jesus in front of all the other disciples, in front of all the other apostles, he said, Jesus, I'll never let you down. Jesus, I got your back. I'm all in. And Jesus is like, man, I'm sorry to tell you this, Peter, but before the sun comes up, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter was like, nah, uh not me. I'm all in. But you all know he did. That's, he, he failed. And his response to his failure is the same thing people still do today. Because you think, listen to me, you think your failures drive Jesus away from you. And you need to know your failures attract Jesus to you. In fact, in Mark's gospel, when the angel tells Mary the way he recounts it, when the angel tells Mary he's not here, he's risen, the angel tells Mary, go tell the disciples and Peter. Okay, well, he's one of the disciples, but Mark he highlights the fact that Jesus knew he failed and he probably knew the condition he was in because he failed, so he called him by name. And the condition that Peter was in is something we all know about. It's called shame and disappointment. You know what disappointment is? Disappointment is the gap between the expectation and the reality. Oh, this is what I thought, this is what I wanted, and this is really what happened. Listen to me, you gotta catch this. With God, there is no gap. God has no gap, he knows all things. Meaning this, God can never be disappointed. So, so God can never say, oh, dang, I can't believe he did that. No, he knew he would do it. He knew, he predicted it, and he shows up to you anyway in the middle of your mistake. So he didn't show up to Pilate. He didn't show up to someone jumping and shouting and praising him. He, he, he went to someone hurting, doubting, and failing. So now Jesus shows up while the disciples are, are fishing, and in verse 15, they, they had finished eating and he pulls Peter off to the side. And Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, that's another one of his names, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And Jesus uses one of the four Greek words used for love. Real quick, let me just explain this because it'll make sense. Your, your New Testament, it actually, the original manuscripts are written in Greek. And, and Greek is a, is a much more descriptive and expressive language. So when we only get the one word love, there's four Greek words for them. So let me give you real quick what the four Greek words for love are. And I'll tell you which ones that he's using here. The first Greek word is storge, which is a natural affection. It's the affection that a son would have for their parents, storge. The second Greek word for love is eros. That's where we get erotic from. But that's like the physical love. It's the same kind of love when you say, I love chocolate, okay? That's, that's eros, okay? Phileo is the third word for love where we get Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. It's the love between friends. And the last one is agape. It literally means that there is no condition in which I will ever stop loving you. It is unconditional love, and that's the word Jesus uses. Peter, do you love me unconditionally? Do you agape me? Look, look, look how he responds. Watch this. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. But he changes the word to phileo. You know I love you, but I can't go there. And that's how failures feel. It's not that they've fallen out of love with God. They just feel like they've disappointed God so much that I can't re-up authentically like that. So I can't say I love you 
unconditionally. I mean, I phileo you maybe Thursday. I could have said I loved you unconditionally, but I've messed up and I've made some mistakes and I've failed and I've fallen and, and, and I'm disappointed in myself. I can't go there, but I do love you. Look, look what Jesus says. I love this. Jesus goes, that's okay. I could still use you. Feed my lambs. Aren't you so grateful that we serve a God that even in our mistakes, it doesn't, his plan for you still stands. This is who God is. And then and he'll still use you. And, and he goes, okay, maybe, maybe he gets it because I'll, I'll, I'm still using him. Let me ask him again. Again, Jesus asked, Simon, son of John, do you agape me? Do you, do you love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he uses the word phileo again. Like, I still can't go there. I know you got a plan and stuff, but ugh. And then Jesus goes, that's fine. Take care of my sheep. Still got a plan for your life. Now look at this. The third time, the third time, Jesus said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And this time, Jesus changed the word to phileo, which means he met Peter right where he was at. So for anyone today, maybe you're, you're here today and you're not hurting and you're not in pain and brokenhearted, and you're not doubting, but you've made some mistakes, and you failed, and you've disappointed, you feel like yourself or God, you need to know God showed up, Jesus showed up intentionally to someone hurting, someone doubting, and he intentionally showed up to someone failing. He could have went anywhere. He went to someone who had miserably failed and, and seemingly disappointed himself, his friends, his family, his God. Jesus wants you to know today, will you write this down? Jesus isn't giving up on you, so you're free to love him right where you are. And he'll love you back and use you for his purposes, even with all your mistakes. And I love that's who Jesus appears to. He could have went anywhere, and he appears to someone hurting, doubting, and failing. And as I was studying this, I was reminded that God didn't just do this on Easter. God has always been showing up unexpectedly in people's life to unexpected people in the middle of their messes. This is the story from Genesis to Revelation. In fact, let me show you in the very first book of the Bible, Genesis. One of the first stories is the fall of man. When Adam and Eve rebelled against God, they sinned against God. And this is what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were open, which means they lost their innocence. And they realized they were naked. They had shame, which is the two things that sin will bring into your life, a loss of innocence and shame. So they did what people do. They sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. They tried to hide what they've done. But that doesn't stop God from pursuing them, does it? And it's not going to stop God. It, he wasn't turned off by Adam and Eve in their rebellion and mistakes. It says... Then the man and his wife heard a sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. So check this out. They're hiding and God's walking towards them. They're hurting and God is pursuing them. And they still hid from the Lord among the trees. And he's coming and searching and they're still hiding because they've disappointed God and they're ashamed of themselves. And the Lord God called to them, where are you? And he's still calling you today. Where are you? And it's not that he doesn't know where you are. He knows exactly where you are. Listen to me, but he wants to let you know he'll come exactly where you are, right where you are. He'll love you from there. God's always been doing this, from the, not just in, in the beginning, but in the end. The very last book of the Bible is Revelation. And the very last words that Jesus says is in Revelation chapter 30, or 3, verse 20. Look at Jesus says, I stand at the door. And knock, there he is making another appearance and it's, it's to all of us this time. In fact, if there were a thousand steps between you and Jesus, listen to me, Jesus would take 999 and then just knock and have you just take one step and open the door. That's it. He's, he's pursuing and showing up to unexpected people, people that you wouldn't, you wouldn't think that, that deserve it, people that are far away, that are broken, that are messed up. He's taken 999 steps and just knocking on the door. If you hear my voice and open the door, he says, I'll come in and I just won't save you. I'll share a meal with you together as, what do you say? As friends. I'm not going to have you join a religion. I'm restoring a relationship. That's what this has been about. This is what God's doing even right now. Right now, he's still doing it. He's still knocking. He's still showing up to unexpected people. In fact, there's this little detail that's easily missed in the resurrection story. Let me go back to it in John chapter 20, verse seven. Remember the cloth that was laying there? Jesus wasn't there, but the cloth was. Look what it says. The face cloth 
which had been on Jesus' head, it wasn't lying with the rest of the linen cloths, but it was folded up in place by itself. Now, to, to catch this, you got to understand Hebrew culture. And they would have, they would have known what this meant. Us, because we're not in Hebrew culture, we, we, we kind of miss it. So let me tell you a little bit about Hebrew culture. When a master was finished, say, with a meal, he'd take that face cloth, and he would wipe his face with it and his beard with it in his hands, and he'd crumple it up and throw it somewhere on the, on the table. And the servants would know the master is finished, clean, clean the table. But if the master folded the napkin and put it next to the plate, no servant would dare touch that plate because the folded napkin means I'm not finished. I'm coming back. Now, in a sense, it is finished. Jesus declared it's finished. And in a sense, it is. The work of salvation and forgiveness is finished. The debt is canceled, is forgiven. But in another sense, Jesus says, I'm not finished. I'm still showing up in people's lives. I'm still knocking on the door. I'm still going to show up in unexpected places to unexpected people. So let me give you my Easter message in a nutshell. Last feeling. Jesus is still meeting people today right where they are. And I think we ought to thank him for that. Come on, give God some praise one more time today. Will you do me a favor and take out this connection card one more time um, before you stir or move? This is still part of the message because every one of you are on the spiritual journey. You're on a spiritual journey and, and you're on just different places of the spiritual journey. And on the bottom of the survey, there are four letters, A, B, C, and D. Here's what I wanna do. Wherever you're at in your spiritual journey today, I want you to find the, the place. I'll tell you what each letter means, but I want you to find the one that kind of um, describes you best and check off that box, okay? Wherever you're at in the journey. So a lot of you are probably in the first A category. The A category of people are the people that say, I already am in a real relationship with Jesus. I love Jesus. I have a relationship with him. I already have that. That's a bunch of you. Praise God. Check off that A box for me, okay? But there is still probably a bunch of you that are in the B category that are saying, well, today, I'd like to do that. I'm believing on Jesus today. I, he's here. He showed up. He's knocking on the door, and I'm not going to brace it anymore. I'm not going to ignore it anymore. I'm going to open that thing, and I'm not joining a church or a religion. I'm starting a relationship, okay? And that's a lot of you maybe need to make that decision for the first time or again today. And still others of you are in the C category that are, that are saying today, I'd like to consider this a bit more. I mean, it was the best sermon I've heard in my life, Pastor, but I'd like to consider this. You didn't have to laugh that loud. Come on now. Because, I, I mean, I'd like to consider this a little bit more. I'm not ready. Can I tell you something? I've always dreamed about a church that was full of these people who are just considering it. And by the way, church, if we ever get to a place where all of us in here are in the A category, we missed it. We missed the mission. And so for anyone in here that's like, I just, I'm considering, I'd like some time. This, you need to know, this is a safe place. This church is a safe place for you to go on that journey and just consider faith in Jesus. And I promise you this, Jesus will meet you right there where you're at. Right there in that place, and we will too. We'll meet you right there and say, that's okay. You can belong here before you even believe. Right there, we'll meet you. This is a safe place for you to investigate a spiritual journey, all right? And then there's the D category. Those of you that say, Pastor, I don't ever intend to make that decision. I come to church once a year because my mom makes me, or I'm just kidding, or whatever, you're here today. I just, just here, and if that's you today, have the guts to, to check the box. If that's what you believe, man, go ahead. Have the guts to just say, I'm just... That's it. That's okay. Here's, here's what I'm going to do. You probably don't care for it much, but I'm going to be praying for you, all right? And secondly, I think everybody needs a pastor. Everybody. If, if not just to marry and bury you and your family. You know what I'm saying? You're going to need a pastor someday. And, and here's, I, I, honestly, I think, I think you do. Everyone needs a church. Everyone needs a pastor. Even if you, you don't ever consider to make this decision, can I tell you something? I'll meet you right where you are. You don't need to ever make this decision, but I would love to be considered someone that you can call upon, this church, you can call upon us, and we'll show up in your life right where you are and help you out whenever you need us, okay? So wherever you are in your spiritual journey, will you just find which one is more or most like you? It'll help us out. There's a few more questions on there that I'd love to get from you. It'll help us kind of take Discovery and the people here at Discovery on a spiritual journey today. Check that off. Do me a favor. Close your eyes with me. Bow your head. 
Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.